Uh, good morning. So this is a, a, a senior class. Uh, as uh, usual, if you are in a very good program, you will find uh, you taking uh, sort of a beginning graduate school level courses. So this actually is sort of like a beginning graduate level courses. It's a graduate level courses in two ways. One is much of what I talk about is not available in textbook form. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, the content is still, uh, is still uh, developing. So in any case, I, I think I just need to see it here. Okay, in any case, uh, uh, I'm going to use this precious two or three hours to give you the whole nine yard. I know I'm going to be running out of time because I want to give you some useful details. Uh, the whole nine yard of polymer mechanics uh, at the chain level. In other words, we are polymer scientists. We like to be able to have molecular strategies. So we want to look at and understand everything at a molecular level. Uh, to begin with, I would uh, emphasize that uh, the polymer is very, very unique. Uh, I always quiz my student. The uniqueness comes from the fact it's a chain. And that uh, offers polymers unique properties, uh, mechanically speaking. So I will uh, indicate for you how we could uh, try to take advantage of that aspect of the fact cha that chains are very long, they inserted into each other, I will show you later. And then we can, because of that, we can try to use uh, uh, we can try to use uh, processing to change structure only if we know what structure can give us better properties. So this is a, a very key aspect. Usually we can do one to one at a time. Uh, it's hard to get all of them connected. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I will just emphasize that uh, the subject has been very challenging. In fact, because of it, very few of us work on it. There is a, according to the Stanford report, there are 80,000 people working on polymer science areas, polymers. A very few of us really look at this very, very important problem of mechanics because all the several hundred billion pounds of polymer, we use them because of their adequate mechanical properties. So, uh, but it's difficult because of this. You're trying to figure out what's governing your polymer behavior from very small scales, you know, the chain level. There are six order of magnitude gap. So let me move on uh, by uh, indicating uh, five books. The first one is mine. So in that sense, I do have a little bit of a black and white I can uh, uh, follow, but the rest I would like to indicate, I will take some statement from the books and indicate uh, the knowledge is uh, a very contemporary books, okay? Look at the years. And, done by, uh, and they are regarded as Bibles in the literature. And I will show you that many of that statement remain, uh, in other words, have, uh, have become very outdated. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, our ultimate goal is really to understand mechanical properties, right? So uh, I, see, I see I already have issues now. Did follow that screen's freezing again. I, I just find this to be really so why it's not following. Okay, it needs a screen on the screen. Yeah, okay, all right. All right, so this part will be edited. <laughs> so in any case, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, uh, to indicate that our final goal is to understand the performance of our polymers. In other words, we will try to understand in the final solid state, either glassy or semi-crystalline, whether we have good enough properties. For example, I'm holding, I don't, yeah, okay, here's the picture. I'm holding a piece of uh, fork and uh, I don't want to make any damage to you guys, so downward. 
Well, you, you probably know it's made of polystyrene. It's brittle. Here is another sample. Uh, I collected many of them in my, in my kitchen. This is a PET, the same as this water bottle. It tend to be rather ductile, and I, you, even if you have a cut, it, it, it is still not, not that bad in terms of uh, uh, having strength there, and clearly ductile like. So we want to understand all that. And it turns out, just so, it's, it just so happened, to understand that means you have to understand them in the liquid state. So that's where uh, you need to uh, deal with rheology because you need to deal with the processing. Okay, and at the end of the day, if you realize that you can uh, understand all that, you will be able to make a progress and make a, a, a transparent PLA cup that we stand water transparent and still ductile, as well as heat resistant. So let me uh, give you a few, uh, so, okay. See, I see this is a challenging thing. To, okay, so let me just uh, uh, give you a few introductions before I move on to the, the main topic. So in any case, these are, uh, uh, these are the ways uh, processing give you trouble and you can try to simulate it, but uh, really uh, simulation currently is still very limiting in terms of what, how, what, can, what, what we can learn from it. So I will go through a, a bunch of rheological aspect of uh, polymers, emphasizing the role of entanglement, which uh, uh, is the key reason why the subject is so difficult. In any case, uh, uh, this movie probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but I will, I will continue and show you. Well, in any case, uh, we are running out of time, so just give you a sense how all the large scale polymers are doing. Okay, here comes the part that if, I, if you can live with this image in your mind, I have achieved a great deal. All your 300 billion pounds of polymer when undergoing processing in the melt state, magnifying a million times, they are all going to look like this. Long chains inserted into each other, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 of them. Okay, I don't even know the English name for that number. You can find out, I'm sure. And the key for us to, is to at least have a structural understanding of what that means. Uh, limited time, I will, I will move on, just give you a sense of it. In any case, there are a host of uh, phenomenology that was really barely understood 20 years ago. If you want to understand it, it's in this book. And I'm going to be very sketchy on this topic, uh, only show a few, a, a, a few uh, evidence that shows you where we can go from here. Let me begin with really the success of reality, not due to me. This is the, the understanding anyone knows, that although you have structures, like PMMA has quite complicated structures to, to a physicist like me, but it turns out we can just treat them as a line. And by assuming that the, uh, each segment of the line has a friction coefficient. And this is the very great success of, of the rheology. What I uh, start to emphasize for our community is that when the chains are very long, you really ought to think them inserting each other like that. And picking up any chain blue, you'll find it will be hooked by other chains like the red one. And as I cool to the glassy state to make my fork, my modulus jumps. Well, what I visualize is this network is still there. In addition, upon, upon vitrification, all the monomers freeze out, fix this network in space. There, yes, you may worry about polycarbonate like my glasses. Uh, you may worry about other polymers. There's issue of microstructure as well. Well, it turns out, as I said, in, in rheology, all polymers to physicists are the same. As long as you give me long enough chain, they will behave identically, rheologically speaking. Once you normalize the relaxation time, for example. And the degree of entanglement, that's how long the chains are, we will talk a little bit more, is, is of course essential. How long they are depend, will determine whether they can insert into each other sufficiently. 
in the solid state, in the glassy state, it turns out we will come to realize that the network has certain structure and it's rather sparse, not dense. We'll come back to this picture again. So in any case, it turns out only recently, uh, last few years, we come to realize that all polymers in the glassy state, amorphous state, can be treated with a, un with a universal picture where the density of the network is identical for all linear flexible polymers to the zero sort. So let me give you now today's uh, 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 topics. Uh, yes, entanglement is everything in reality. So I'm going to talk a little bit about reality in terms of appreciating what is entanglement by a few examples of how to think about it. Uh, uh, how to think about this entanglement in the liquid state. So let me just begin by giving you this outline. So that's topic one. Topic two is to recognize that network that you visualize in rheology in the melt state when you cool down, persist and exist as, as a way of chain reaching out to each other through networking. And in the solid state, there obviously could be either amorphous or semi-crystalline and they need to be dealt separately. And obviously the amorphous state is a much simpler case. So we will talk about, for example, gee, what is the strength, ultimate strength of our polymers polystar? The breaking I just showed you is due to what? Chemical, break, chemical bond breaking? If that, you blame the chemist, give me a better bond than covalent bond, carbon-carbon bond. If not, is this the problem for the physicist? So uh, depending on how much time, I will go through a little bit of that. And then I will show a little bit about the crystalline state, at least the way we can manipulate the structure to achieve a better property through processing. And then lastly, uh, I may run out of time. I will say a little bit about, hopefully, say a little bit about fracture mechanics. And there, there's this whole myth of what is fracture mechanics in terms of whether it really can achieve the objective that uh, we, we wish to uh, uh, obtain. Probably it will be challenging to get there. Uh, so, okay. So uh, we have uh, uh, I know this is a, a, a part, so let, let, me, let me go by my outline, which I printed here. Uh, let me go by, by, by the first topic. Okay, we talked about, uh, in this first topic, we really want to understand what is entanglement. In the male state. And it turns out uh, a good way to start is to, uh, uh, have a different formula for rub elasticity. So I will not bore you with, except to show you that if you have rubber elasticity, you can show that your stress is proportional to the, plat to the modulus. And, and the sh in the case of shear, that will be shear strength. Okay. Uh, I, I know I, I'm uh, being a little bit sketchy here now. Uh, I'm assuming you guys, uh, or had the knowledge uh, of uh, the, what, the, what is the, a way to measure the shape change. So that's, that's the shape change in shear. If you recall, your modulus is given in terms of AT per vo physical volume between cross links. Okay, so if this is a cross link, that's a physical chain. Then it turns out the, um, then it turns out the physical volume is what dictates the stiffness of your rubber. I know many of your students here deal with rubber, so it's quite useful to, to speak about it. This physical volume is where I start to introduce the concept of so-called packing model. I know I'm being sketchy, that's okay because uh, uh, because uh, a packing lens is discussed in detail in my book. This is among the most important parameter, even the chemists should love to know about it very well, called packing lens. It's only second to cone lens as important as this. The packing lens 
is to, is to say, I can figure out your physical volume. Your physical volume is, let me do it in the pedagogical way. Your physical volume, of course, is proportional to the size of your chain squared, because a Gaussian chain, that's proportional to the number of, to proportional to chain length. And the missing length is packing. So this can be written as P Rx Rx. And therefore, I'm going to write this as AT Rx P Rx. Okay, so it turns out that this term, of course, force. Of course, it has the dimension of one over area. What is this term? This term, of course, has the dimension of force. So it turns out your G can be written as a force times a cross-sectional area density. What is the area density? It's, it's when you uh, uh, look at this network head on. So if I have, uh, I know I'm running out of time all the time, x, y, z. If I look at the x, y dimension, I see the bonds coming out like this. And I'm counting how many of them without giving you the derivation, which is in the book that this is a account of the error density of this strength. So all of a sudden you see that your rub elasticity, which is so abstract, so abstract its expression, derives a new meaning. It is phi times whichever you call it, you may call it the retractive force. And that force is dictated by an elementary part and the degree of deformation. In other words, this force is a function of deformation. So I managed to very quickly give you an essence of an alternative way to express rubber elasticity, offering you insight about the origin of stress. It should be thought of as coming from how the chain bear low. And how much force there is resisting my deformation depends on how dense my network is, which is this parameter. Okay, this is a crucial part of it. Since we recorded it, I don't mind being fast because you can always come back to the recording to look at it again. So that's it. This, in fact, this part is in, in chapter one of my book as well. So let's move on. Once we uh, 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 introduce that, uh, we, 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 we further understand uh, we further understand, yeah, here it comes, that uh, uh, that uh, that oh what, what? because it changed the screen, it doesn't recognize that color. Uh, that the, the chains inserted into each other, right? There are many of them, gazillion number of them, easily 10 to the 18, 15, you know, depending on your molecular weight, any piece you hold. Just a tiny piece of your thumb will have that many molecules in, so many. And you are trying to shear them like crazy. And I know I have very little time to talk about uh, all the uh, basic uh, language we use, but basically you are tr in processing, you have so little time, so you tend to deform them very fast. And uh, I had this. Okay, I did miss a few slides. I did miss a few slides. No, I'm I'm fine. So uh, the uh, I I I meant to 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 give you a, a sense of how these uh, uh, basic modes of measurement 
look like, but uh, perhaps there are too many topics. So, so basically, you uh, uh, a, a leading way to to think about uh, polymers is actually is actually processing, right? So you squeeze your sample, and some sample will come out from from from, from a, a dye, and what comes out. Uh, is what I showed you in the first movie. And it's dominantly shear-like. This is why people go to a shear experiment to mimic what you may see in processing. So the uh, one, these, these molecules, I know we didn't go through reputation in your course probably, but basically all these 10 to the 18 chains inserted into, into each other, in the melt state, they move around, and it takes the time of tau to move around. But you're not waiting for tau time. You are going to extrude this piece out in a time much shorter than tau. So the chains really go crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, have enough mobility to wait for them to be squeezed in. So it, uh, it really uh, 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 causes you to to wonder whether this textbook assumption of shear is correct. So I know uh, we are, oops, I know, so we need to go to the next page. So I know that, uh, that this is a, one of the classic result uh, about untangled polymers. It turns out it shears, but it doesn't shear homogeneously. Okay? And even wait for steady state to occur it does not get sheared homogeneously. So this is a, a really a, a problem uh, only discovered uh, 15 years ago uh, for, for all these, uh, when the polymers are sufficiently untangled, this problem is expected to occur. And that changes the way uh, we perceive how to, to think about rheology. So this is another crucial experiment where you make a so-called step shear in other words, you change your shape like that, and then you hold it. For decades, our perception is if you hold it, nothing should happen, but this movie shows the sample breaks apart internally. So this really is a nightmare uh, in terms of uh, shaking the foundation of what we know about polymer rheology. So I'm just here giving you a, a, a believe, sort of believing my words. I have a, a whole book developing the argument, all evidence for it. That, uh, and, uh, that this is an additional complication in male, rheo in male rheology, that, that, that this failure, before it happens internally, could happen at the, at the surface. In fact, that previous movie, you have to remove this failure at the surface to be able to see it. In any case, uh, this affects how you make a measurement, affects how you understand rheology, and, uh, uh, and can be understood. Once they are understood, you can even try to predict that the slip call will not occur during shear, but after shear. Okay, so this is, this is a powerful uh, look at this failure occurred after shear. So uh, in any case, uh, you, uh, I, I'm just flashing through a, a few results here. Uh, uh, one more uh, uh, prediction was if you take a piece of polymer melt, you stretch it, and you hold that stretched filament, and you can predict based on the physics we know that it will break up. Uh, I, I don't... Uh, uh, so this is one of the last results I can show you, uh, uh, the stretching of a uh, filament depending on the rate at which you stretch, different uh, lo strand localization takes place, and uh, including one that, that really is uh, quite uh, uh, surprising because there's no uh, cross-linking. So this sample, you can see it breaks as if it was cross-linked. Okay, so in absence of cross-linking, your polymer could behave as if it's cross-linked. That's the extreme form or extreme behavior of what entanglement can do because of the chain uncrossability. So uh, to wrap up this part, I, let me just uh, 
uh, this is all introductory part in the sense I want to get to the mechanics of it. But uh, to wrap this up, uh, let me offer you some uh, uh, notion of how to understand this. I here take the opportunity to say that polymerology has transformed according to me in terms of how we understand it. However, this understanding published, look at how you can see it, published 14 years ago has yet to catch up in the sense uh, people are still, uh, let's say, resisting the basic idea here, okay? Uh, so there are still this parallel universe right now. There are the universe according to me and the universe according to the majority of other researchers in the community. For us, the insertion of chains into each other pr producing uncrossability, known as entanglement, mostly speaking, uh, is not something you can describe by treating a chain in a tube. That's the dominant story. This chain in the tube interact with the other chains smoothly. The beauty of this model is it can be analytically worked out to calculate anything you wish to have. I call this perhaps curve fitting if the physics is not what we realistically encounter. So you can have your beautiful theory. You can produce all the predictions and sometimes it deceivingly even agree with the experiment which I went into detail to discuss in my book about why that agreement could occur. But it really is not reality. It appears the reality, look, this is where you need to avoid institutionalized learning. Don't believe me, believe yourself. I could only offer what is, uh, what I perceive to be what's happening. In any event, we have to answer, the, we have to acknowledge it appears. This picture, by the way, that I draw there is not unique, it's not due to me. Anyone would perhaps accept that your polymer should look like that, a polymer male. Uh, what such a picture does, delivers for us, is perhaps where we can uh, debate. Uh, I take this, uh, not literally, but uh, very seriously, I take it to mean that if I do processing, if I do stretching, as I showed you in the previous phenomenology, uh, my red chain can be stretched, so-called stretch, deformed, because my other blue chains are grabbing onto it and try to move. And the blue chains are moving because the next green chain is grabbing on the blue chains. And the next green blue chain is, is uh, connected to the next purple chain. And this goes on for a million times until they reach the end of my sample, the two ends. So when I stretch, for example, uh, the ultimately looking at red chain, the red chain will get stretched. As a consequence, you build chain tension. That's a loose term. Yes, essentially, anytime you deform a chain, it turns out that chain resists that deformation. So there's force against that. So you build this force, apparently a proportional in the case of shear or extension, is proportional to how much you have stretched deform. But it keeps growing, but they cannot grow indefinitely without bound. So you has to, there will have to be a point where this chain stop deforming. Because the available chain, which is blue chain grabbing it, is finite. So this is what I hope to call it famous or not. I hope it's going to get famous because it's, according to me, it's true. Speaking of truth, this is where the science gets difficult. Theory gets difficult because uh, it's still difficult to use simulation 
to literally show this. And we are trying, and there are other people trying in computer simulation. But this is what presumably happening. That red chain is doing what this rubber is doing. My fingers are the blue chain. So you will reach a point of so-called forcing balance, when I say this famous, because this is a new concept replacing much of what we know in polymer reality. And this forcing balance is the point of producing yield. The sample breaks apart or no longer can deform elastic. So let me just quickly uh, uh, indicate that the first part, that there, this, this feature is known as a melt rupture or shock skin. It's happening in the film blowing movie I had. People need to spend millions of dollars to remove this feature in order to, pro to blow your film properly. Okay, so that, uh, 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 the, the, the physics of that apparently is related to the physics what I show you below. When you deform, some part breaks apart okay, locally. Uh, so I only had this uh, uh, 30 minutes to talk about this part. Uh, I usually offer a, a course on this uh, every other year. So you can sign up for that if you want to get to know the details. Okay, I want to move on. Uh, with given time, I, I, I hope to move on and and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, remind you this picture again. So we are done with the the, the melt state. Uh, the key part, as you, as I told you, is is we are going to be we are, it's legitimate to ignore the chemical details because all the chemical details turns out is already expressed in the packing line. So it turns out your packing lines for polystyrene is almost four and strong. Sorry. For polyethylene, it's only 1.7. And it is merely a difference between polyethylene being very thin and polystyrene being very thick. It's basically like this two lines. Okay. Here comes the crucial part, which, uh, the, uh, of which I understand it only uh, two years uh, uh, ago, uh, which is, uh, sorry, which is, uh, which is uh, to understand in this glassy state, you can have polystyrene, you can have my polycarbonate on, on my glasses. Can we do what we did in rheology? Rheology, as I said, P will account for all the difference between different polymers. Okay, they're all flexible, very uh, mobile, moving around linear chains, if they are linear. I'm only restricting myself to the linear case for now. Uh, the bulkiness of the chain, in fact, is a aspect we never, this book, or we never had enough resources to look into about how the P changes the rheology. In a quantitative way, qualitative way, as I said, they are all the same. So once you cool down to the glassy state, the key question for a physicist is, again, you've got all different glassy polymers. Do I have a unique language? Do I have a way to characterize or parameterize them? Right? And uh, I tell you right away, there are two things uh, or two, uh, that you encounter. One is this, look, in addition to this network, all the monomers jams up, freeze up. And the way they stay in this dormant state is called glassy state. The nature of the glassy state today, no physicist, no scientist know exactly how to describe this state. It's a very mysterious state because crossing a very few degrees in temperature, all of a sudden this material lose mobility. So how this collectiveness 
occurs because losing mobility means there are not enough monomers around for any given monomer to move around. So they all suddenly freeze up. That's the nature of glass transition. Nobody still understands it. As a result, we cannot answer today why polystyrene is brittle, polycarbonate is ductile. We don't have predictive, uh, anything predictive to say about any polymer as a consequence, whether they are brittle or ductile. Once you tell me it's TGs here and I'm 50 degrees below TG, I don't know the answer whether it's brittle or ductile. Nobody knows. It's better that we know the answer that nobody knows than the fact we mistakenly think we know. There's plenty of evidence that we don't. Uh, what about the universality part, right? I just, I told you the, the polymer in the male state, it's all look like this. And in the glassy state, I will take some time uh, soon to describe this part for you, this picture for you in detail. Uh, in, 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 uh, in this uh, 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 polystyrene, you, you, I just broke it. So you can look at that surface that I broke. You look into that surface, you find the red dots of them. I will tell you exactly how to calculate, which is already given here. It's already given here. The size of your molecule in terms of cross-sectional area is P times cone length. We will, we will introduce it. Yeah, yeah, we will introduce it again, yeah. Yeah, only, yeah, only S, only S is my own notation. The other two is conventional. So I will get to that. So, yeah, so, uh, 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 the, the, because this picture will, 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 uh, will uh, uh, be pertinent for to many things. So let me uh, uh, indicate to you when you cut your polymer through, uh, uh, of course not all the bonds are perpendicular to my surface, but let's forget about that projection. Just assume all the bonds are coming to the surface. And this will be the area I will define called S. And there are, of course, we don't call space filling, you can call it area filling, right? That area is filled out like this. That's all the bonds coming to that surface. What about this network? Didn't I just say that, uh, sorry here. Didn't I just say that the network is what we learn that they exist in from learning rheology. That network survives in the solid state and that network is perceived as I showed here. If you think about that network and if you make a cut, you find that network is much more sparse, represented by the solid circles. Now the open circles are not part of the network. What I was trying to say here is this ratio, in other words, the fraction of the solid dots to the total dots, solid and open, is argued recently in my theory to be a constant. I will go into a little more detail. So this is just giving you a mental picture of what the conceptual picture of what it is. This is a constant because for most linear flexible polymers, cone length is not changing very much, not by a factor of four to 1.7, 50% change mostly. And I argue that this low bearing strand, which I will have to introduce later, is actually proportional to cone lens. And therefore, it doesn't matter what cone lens you have, this ratio is a constant. So I derived a picture where all polymers will have the same efficacy in terms of its, its chain network uh, 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 embedded in, the, in, in its uh, solid state in terms of what that chain network structure is. 
So let me patiently come to the second part of this. And uh, I will start to utilize uh, and develop these notations properly. So we're coming to, uh, we have 15 minutes before we break. We're coming to a second part of this. Uh, this is a large part of it. Uh, it is in the spirit, a large part in the course on, on, on mechanics or engineering properties of polymers. And once again, it just so happens that chain network is a word I use. But in the literature, people have loosely called this entanglement. I have stopped using the word entanglement because it has already been used in biology. So I will make many emphasis here. First thing first, and what is entanglement? Well, people say, oh, you ask me that? I don't know what it is, especially because we don't exactly know how to analytically capture that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, if the effect of entanglement as well. Two model was att attempt to do it. The way I do it, where, where the entanglement produce some point-like interaction, point-like interaction, is non-analytical. In other words, I have a mental picture of what it does, but we, it's so hard to uh, analytically develop a depiction, quantitative depiction of how this uh, does. But ultimately, I think it's not wrong to say entanglement means uncrossability. However, I start to, for solid state, call this uncrossability chain networking to different, you know, to, to differentiate from uh, uh, from what it does in in rheology. Uh, so I will go through a few concepts here and ultimately uh, answer the question of brittle ductile translation or why why your PET is so ductile. That question is a legitimate question. It has to be properly answered at the molecular level. Why polymer is capable of being ductile? That is not a predictive question. It is a question to, to, to understand where that comes from. So let me, uh, 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 this first one is very important. The strength of your polymer. It turns out it's, it's, it, it is absolutely an essential question. And let me start with that. And I, you see, I indicated strength of solid polymers. My God, that will be infinitely difficult to answer, perhaps infinitely difficult to answer, if you don't first try to answer it in the case of a, the polymer being amorphous. The beauty of being amorphous is it's so familiar to us because in the real in the melt state they are disordered, they are amorphous. So, so, so our concept, our perception about what happens, uh, uh, can be carried over in some way. But let's get to this point. So I know I need to hear. So this is one of the three books that I will quote many times. Uh, or at least I'll quote it here. Uh, it deals with uh, the strength. I know we have uh, uh, this recording, so in principle you can uh, read it in detail. But basically, uh, it's discussing in the introductory chapter of this book, supposedly regarded as textbook, to acknowledge several to acknowledge several things. One is it's to acknowledge that the chemical bonds are three nanonewtons strong. You need three nanonewtons to break it. Secondly, he take a case of polyethylene and showed you the S is 0.18 nanometers, which is P times cohen. I'll get to the detail of that again. And therefore, the strength, see how useful this notation is? Remember, this is the same notation I used to give you the alternative 
expression for rub elasticity in the first 10 minutes. Stress is coming from resistance or force per, per chain. So if you take these two products together, you find your strength should be 17 gigapascals of polyethylene. But polyethylene was only found to have 150 megapascals before it breaks. No matter how much you love your polyethylene, and it's a great polymer, it turned brittle at around minus 160 degrees, 60 degrees below Tg. At that point, it breaks like glass, like this polystyrene, and it shows a force of this level. Okay, it just breaks. And you find, basically, if you look at SS curve, so if you're trying to stretch it, uh, let's just make a simple force divided by the area. And this is L over L, zero. And you'll find your polyethylene will just break in a few percent, let's say 5%, and reaching a force of 150 megapascals. Okay? But didn't you say that you should have a force of 17 gigapascals? So that's a factor of 100. Smaller. Okay. Not only he, uh, 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 that the polyethylene is doing that, all 13 polymers Vincent found is doing that. In other words, Vincent was convinced that his plot should be expressed as stress, by, uh, uh, plotted as function of the density phi. Again, I will come next page or two to, to show you what is the, how to calculate this density. And what's in front of that, of course, is just the slope. He found, this is a, a figure, very classic, cited by all textbooks. He found for all these polymers, this coefficient, which is this, is not Fb, but smaller than Fb by a factor of 100. Oh, man, that's just confusing. You read it uh, one book after another, and you'll find that it says uh, it means chain must not be breaking. So according to this, chain must well not be breaking or, or even just 1% break, the rest didn't. And this confusion is related to this picture. In this confusion, it was taken that every bond is bearing load and have a level of chain breaking. If that's the case, you will have 17 gigapascals. You can get close. Look. The book, in fact, even wrote about it. If you make a fiber, you can get quite close. You can get five gigapascals. Getting close. But not for a non-fiber, an isotropic piece of sample. So I will show you what's going wrong with this basic estimate. Well, first thing, what, what's wrong is not all the bonds bear load. Okay, not all these bonds coming to the surface is bearing the load. So, your phi is wrong. The density is wrong. Secondly, starting is just as good. Secondly, that breaking may not be breaking of the chemical bond. It turns out, what turns out is, 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 what about the chain just slide out? That would achieve the same purpose as breaking. In fact, there are arguments that I developed in a book chapter arguing that there's very little chain session. I'll just pull out. Okay, uh, I just want to indicate that this, I just want to indicate that this is not alone in one book. It's 
oh, sorry, I, I, I apologize. It looked like this figure was not there when I was doing all this. Guys should have asked. <laughs> I was writing on my screen that you guys didn't see it. Okay, so this is the, the, the Vincent plot of 13 polymers. Oh my God, I was writing it, you are not seeing it, invisible to you until now. Okay, so this is what I was writing. Uh, yeah, I was writing it without that figure, gosh. So in any case, now you see it, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that force uh, is not breaking force, and this density is not the density of this. And this are uh, the reasons you can perhaps account for the fact that it's, there's a, a factor of 100 missing. I just want to indicate that this is not alone. This is another book saying identical things. Oh my God, look at the 13 polymers. There's just one, less than 1% that could involve chain fission. That statement alone misses the point that all the chain, not all the chains are low buried. So let me use that uh, space here to give you the argument of the cross-section area of a molecule. You do the following. You take a chain. You take a chain. Oh, Xin Chen, you ask uh, what's the physical volume of that chain? Well, that chain, of course, should be proportional to how many monomers I have, the physical volume. In fact, you know, by definition, it should be if each repeat, each monomer has a physical volume of V1, then there should be just NV1 of them. But I know a different way to look at it. I know it means that the physical volume should be proportional to the Gaussian chains and to end distance. It's end to end distance, according to what you know for Gaussian chain, is not an L that would be for perfectly flexible chains, but larger than that by a factor of the so called characteristic ratio. Just take it as uh, if you see it first first time, that's fine. It's called characteristic ratio. Okay. So this physical volume should be proportional to that because this factor has this factor has that n in there. And the power, whoever introduced this, is amazing. The power of this argument is this is the volume, this is the lens, there's a missing lens, that missing lens is packing lens. I don't, whoever, it turns out, I, I did homework and wrote a paper on this point. There were four groups independently in the mid 80s discovered this concept called P. It, there's nothing more important and elegant than, than this quantity in polymer physics, in my opinion altogether. By identification, you will figure out, sorry. By identification, okay. You, page I produced. By identification, you find E1 is nothing but have it P C squared. Okay, that's V1. The size of each monomer. And I'm going to rearrange it by writing it, by assuming my chain can be viewed as if it is a tiny cylinder each of the chain. And the cylinder has a length of L cross section of L. 
L S. So if you split that, so if you split that, the S is nothing but P C infinity times L. Well, C infinity times L is roughly speaking the cone length. In other words, the the Antoine distance is usually can be written as this. Whereas the where this uh, 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 Cartesian ratio times the bond length is the cone length. And in fact, if you write this as what you are familiar with as cone length, you realize that this argument occurs because cone length times the number of cone segments is the same as the number of bonds times bond length. So I have a proof for you what S is. It is packing lines times the cone length. Yes, please. Let's take a break. Okay. So let's continue. Uh, now, now we know what is uh, what is S. Then, of course, the density is one over S. In other words. In every S space, I can find one bound coming through my surface. Um, we'll get to the point of uh, whether all bonds are load bearing or not uh, later. But but you understand, right now this whole concept of uh, uh, this whole concept of this nine, of this thirteen polymers. What's plotted here is the phi, the density. So this x x oops. This x axis. This x axis is the density area density. And this axis is the stress. And Vincent found, at least for this 13 polymers, they obey a linear relationship. And therefore, this. These are all thermoplastic. So, so in fact, uh, all. Uh, so the only thermal set is what I, I don't speak about. Today, and uh, uh, rubber we don't talk a lot because uh, I think don't think we have time. So mostly this is all all of this are thermoplastic. Some are actually already semi-crystalline, so this plot has certain issues in that sense. But generally, uh, this is what the Vincent found, and uh, uh, later there was another study along the same line added five more polymers. So basically there are 18 polymers following this line. The trouble is this uh, slope is too small compared to the force to break the chains. So uh, let me just uh, con continue on this. Uh, I see I see I'm not, again not on the same page. Yeah, here. Uh, Sorry, I, I'm parting again. So this is the this is the 13 polymers we had, and uh, we talked about uh, uh, the error density of this, uh, which is what Vincent used. Uh, the reason he used it is uh, perhaps he thought every bond will suffer breakage, or will bear load. That would be the only reason he did it. Uh, it turns out uh, uh, that give you a factor of 100 difference. And if you read one more book, okay, you, you will find uh, essentially the, uh, the, 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 the issue of this factor of 100. And he says maybe this is, this is a godlike figure, okay? 
uh, uh, world passed away recently. So this is a, a Bible book. And, uh, uh, but he's not able to express his opinion uh, uh, very explicitly. So for example, this factor of 100 between what you measure versus what is theoretically possible, uh, he would say, oh, one possibility of this discrepancy is probably there are flaws, according, which is something I, I hope I have time to say, but see how much time I have. And uh, see that this, he says same thing, the broken number of chains must be very small because there's a factor of 100 difference. Uh, uh, so let, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, as I, I indicated, is, let, let's move on. So these, are, despite the fact these are, are, are the latest understandings in this book, which is on mechanics of solid polymers, it's very interesting that the author prefer not to explicitly even discuss what is the strength of polymer or plastic? Perhaps he knows uh, it's, it's difficult to answer. And because we don't know it, people through fracture mechanics save us. And I'm not sure it's saving us. So that I see if uh, we have time to discuss that or not. In any case, let me jump to uh, the core part of the business which is that this PET is ductile at room temperature. And indeed, you need to understand why it's ductile. But understanding what is ductile is not enough. As I try to say it in, in polymer physics too, I, I'm not sure I have time to go through any of that issue of iring idea of uh, activation. The problem is even your poly, PET, as you keep cooling, it would at some point turn brittle. So any theory you have to explain that it's ductile at room temperature must be also a theory that can explain why it turns brittle as I cool. That did not exist. According to the book as recent as this one, 2012, uh, they are still using the concept of so-called uh, uh, LDO hypothesis by saying, oh, you know, at high temperature is ductile because the yield stress is much lower than the breaking stress. And somehow magically they have different temperature dependence so there will be a crossing point. And beyond that point, oh, the breaking stress is lower than the yield stress. So of course it will break. I'm very unsatisfied with that statement uh, because it doesn't really, it doesn't really explain anything. Uh, although these are, you know, like, oh, that's the giant in fracture mechanics. So, uh, oh, by the way, in fact, this book further says, you know, if you take this hypothesis approach, it bypasses the relevance of fracture mechanics to brittle failure. Oh Lord, what does that mean? So you don't have to do fracture mechanics? Is fracture mechanics wrong, right? Well, in any case, this philosophy of trying to explain brittle ductile transition by merely saying yield and breaking are two independent process, whichever wins is the one that has lower stress, uh, really is not very satisfactory. I uh, developed a detailed criticism or argument or, or which is probably too strong word. I basically rephrases what this means in this paper in, in great detail, uh, because I was very intrigued by the lack of a better uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, what, what is uh, going on in terms of brittle ductile transition. So let me come back to, to, uh, to the model, okay? I, I probably can say a word about condensation, but that's a simple part of it. So let's, let's go to what we think is happening. And uh, and uh, uh, Jesus. 
Ist da der? I'm losing my pen now. Must be some reason. I, uh, okay. I'm recovering everything. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, for the moment talk uh, for a minute about uh, about uh, uh, answering the question of brittle ductile. Transition, or answering the question of why polymer can be ductile. So by now, I think you are familiar with this picture and uh, this goes on and on, several hundred thousands of this. And what one can perceive is, right, after many of them, is when I, drag, when I pull on my chain, we call it drawing, uh, this chain network uh, is going to get displaced. So you know, you're missing many of them. So eventually you're holding them, you are displacing. And it's obvious to perceive that as long as I have these junctions, I will be able to transmit the action of the displacement from one end to another, okay? So the key part is really, first thing first, is really roughly figuring out what is this uh, unit? Okay, so it turns out this unit can be thought of as following. If this is your plan, if your chain is uh, uh, coming in, out, in, out, if it comes in, let's see, cutting the surface three times, then it seems to me that you will have a chance of establishing some, through uncrossability, establishing some networking, right? And it turns out, of course, this chain need to be sufficient long to achieve that. So let's say, make three, her three points onto the surface. So it need to be this long, at least. This is the, the whole story. Our plastic industry, our whole polymer, the reason you need high molecular weight is only when the chains are long enough, you can have, you can take advantage of uncrossability. Unprocessability is strong because it's as strong as covalent bond. Any secondary bonds are much weaker. So, uh, so you want to harvest this, this, uh, this covalent bond strength. But it's a coil, not like a fiber, it's a coil. So it turns out that it wiggles back and forth that give you the opportunity to hook with others. And this lens, I'm not going to uh, go into perhaps great detail. I'm not going to give you the detailed mathematical description, which is in the book, by the way. But roughly, it is going to involve the following. So it's actually quite easy to do. I'm not going to give you the rigorous definition, but I want to give, show you the map of where, the, where it goes. Basically, you have these things. We already know it's S. That's all coming out of the surface, all of them. Basically, you're going to count uh, uh, in a given area, which is the size of the chain, okay? And uh, uh, there will be, uh, there will be uh, basically, 
how many times, let's say uh, Q times coming into the surface, each time it's this, and there are this many chains, and this many chains should have an area of R pi square. So I'm not defining properly for you. Q is the number of times it comes to the surface. S is the S I defined already. Q, the capital Q, is how many chains are involved. Yeah, let me do it. In other words, this surface could have this many. I know I didn't do it properly. Uh, this many black chains, or this many green chains, a uh, uh, purple, uh, 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 pink chains, and this many blue chains. So there are many. Okay, in the cross section of R G. Okay, so you can calculate that. So th that number is this capital Q. Each of them occupy S, and each chain folds back and forth Q time. Okay, so you can have an exact calculation of what is Q. Let's say Q3 is what I need, because I can see three times is about right to give me the possibility of cross-linking from, from uncrossability. So it turns out that you work out all that, it's in the book, it turns out magically that number one, it is proportional to tone line, this line. So this is what I worked out. It, it, uh, uh, it says what it, did, it says. So the second point is, if this is the size of your, if you like mesh size of your network, then the area density turns out is one over P times this cone length. Sorry, times this uh, 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 strand length. Okay. And this strand length, as I said, is proportional to K. Therefore, it is proportional to P over the cone length. Okay. What, are, what is this? This is phi that we previously talked about. So one can powerfully show that your network structure depends on P in the same way as phi depend on P. So that's the first element of uh, uh, information I want to give you. Uh, what's useful about this is the second one, second point I want to make. That is, When the computer changes the mode, sometimes the drawing is missing. That I have not figured out. Or two. Now it's now it comes back. Then I have to go back there. Probably now it will show up. I just don't know what the procedures look like. So in any case, let me talk about. So I. I for this, for this topic, I just talked about the structure. Okay? It's one over, it's proportional to P over C, or rather it is P over C, and that's proportional to phi. The second point I want to make is something called, uh, you can call it limiting stretching. This is a very useful concept. It's, it's everywhere in polymer physics. which is this concept. If you have a strand, let's say a Gaussian chain of size R, then you ask yourself how much stretching you need to have so that this chain is straightened. So that the length is L. 
if it's ans is l, let me just use the notation of cone lens, and it will be this. The number of cone lens times the cone lens. Uh, then it turns out the amount of stretching you need The number of stretching you need, of course, is L over R. Yeah, that's how much I need to stretch so that R become L. That is N cone lens. The downstairs is square root of N cone lens. So it's square root of n. Okay, so if that's the concept, my L uh, can be also straightened uh, by by having the same concept, so essentially this uh, phi. Sorry. This uh, remember I I, I indicated this uh, relationship. Uh, rewrite it. Phi is one over p l c l c. Sorry, and this is one over p l k. So the ratio of the two is exactly the strand lens over cone lens. I have in my model called this load bearing strand. So C is load bearing strand. If you use that concept, then this ratio is load bearing strand over cone lens. And this is nothing but also the stretching of uh, 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 of uh, it will take you lambda amount to stretch your network so that I know this part is a little bit jumpy, but I, I, I only have this much time for it. Basically, for you to achieve from this state to make all uh, open circle to become a field circle amounts to a stretching of a level from, from uh, given by the ratio of the two. I know this, uh, uh, as I said, I'm just running a little bit out of time. I, I, uh, I just hope you to believe me for the moment. If you can stretch your uh, 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 sample uh, finally to a level of this to that, then by, by definition, the network uh, is now no longer sparse. It's going to be all condensed. And, and that's how we did fiber spinning. So in other words, I, I have this concept of uh, geometric condensation in mind. You have this many strands, let's say we count it as uh, nine field circles. Okay. The reason they are not area filling is because this chain is a Gaussian chain. Uh, it wasted a lot of space coming back to its own surface without bearing load. It only bear load once because it's a one coil, it's one bare strand. So there are a lot of wasted areas. Unless you do something to uh, straighten your chain, Gaussian chain into, into chopsticks like. So for example, you can just draw it in the melt state. Uh, you still have this many chains, but this nine ch uh, chains now is in a much smaller cross-sectional area. So eventually in the limit, ideally, you can straighten all the chains, then all the chains are going to be effectively load bearing. Why I say that? I say that because industry used this from day one, many decades ago. So this is polystyrene. This is this, this movie. Sorry, my God, you guys, 
you guys are not, uh, uh, you're not uh, uh, yelling at me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a screen that you don't see. Sorry. So did I, uh, so in any case, I, sorry for this. So basically I was, I was uh, trying to tell you guys that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there is a way to make your material much more efficient in load bearing. A Gaussian chain is wasting a lot of cross-section area because the chain has to come back and forth into the same surface without bearing load each time they come. Okay, so, so a lot of this is just a, a secondary Van der Waals interactions. Only the circles, field circles bear load. And the way to achieve better bear loading is if you could condense it, if you could draw them so that your coil become chopsticks like. And, and that was what I was trying to say. Unfortunately, I apologize for, 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 for not uh, saying that, not giving this picture. So the, here is the, here is the uh, uh, as I said, there are nine chains here. And if I start to stretch in a melt state in that fine limit, I could obviously my sample will uh, uh, cross sectionally will shrink, but I could still preserve that nine chains. Now I achieve some condensation. And in fact, I, as I said, you could try to re even reach the limit of 100%. That would be perfectly uh, spent fiber. So the, the reason I say this is this polystyrene, very brittle, through such a process, turns very ductile. And in the industry, uh, what well, you realize that this stretching turns out makes the sample very strong when you draw along the same direction as male stretching. But in the perpendicular direction, it's weakened. So therefore, in the industry, typically this process is used, in process, is used for films so that you can have bad actual stretching. So you have uh, basically, uh, 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 basically you have uh, uh, condensed your segment into the thickness direction. The only weakness is in the thickness direction, but since it's a film, you don't use the, weak, uh, the strength of the thickness direction. But that's called bi actual uh, uh, orientation. They do that for polystyrene, do that for poly, uh, uh, polypropylene, they do lots of different things. So, uh, so the, uh, I, I probably should, should uh, 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 add, add one more slide to this. Let me add one more slide to this. Uh, so what, I don't want to skip this part. So let me add to this. So what do we have uh, in mind now? What we have in mind is to recognize that I have a network, keep going, that I even know the structure of it. It's phi, it's one over the load, sorry, load bearing strength. It's one of these strengths. It's usually a Gaussian distribution, but let's assume it's uniform for simplicity. And uh, millions and millions of them. And you visualize that the first thing that happens is if you like, if you like, is that uh, along this chain, uh, along this uh, network, uh, uh, tensions start to build up, okay? Meanwhile, it's, uh, it's trying to drag the other monomers around to, make them, to give them some mobility. And that's what's happening. And if you sit at a high enough temperature, as you labor to do this, all these monomers will not refuse to wake up 
and say, let's go, let's have a party. And so we are all just start to move, accommodating for what the external deformation is doing. So you achieve shape change. So you achieve ductility. So if you look at the stress, it will just uh, reach a, uh, a point. It's glassy, but then at some point, this thing really turns mobile and you can really start to plastically uh, deform. Uh, this could occur in the form of uh, uh, necking or whatnot. Uh, I can't go into some detail if uh, I have time. Uh, so basically, uh, I think I have time to make a comment. Basically, uh, there is the idea of what is why you have yield. Yield means, uh, in our case, means really glassy or elastic, purely glassy to plastic transition. And it's because you this network is building enough. Uh, is introducing enough mobility as it drags its neighbors. In the detailed picture, we, we like to think that uh, uh, the denser the network, it's easier for you to, to uh, drag other chains around. And as a result, sorry, as a result, uh, we can explain this. The reason that, 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 that after male stretching, the polystyrene turns ductile, is because now you have a denser number of drivers. You know, the, the chain network is denser. So they have a fewer neighboring strands to activate, to mobilize. So you achieve ductility this way. Uh, but the key part is not uh, explaining why it can yield. Polymer is magically, uniquely able to yield and draw very large uh, uh, reach, uh, you know, stretching ratios because it's a network. A network can deform. And there is a simple explanation for why yielding can occur that's due to iron, right? Basically says, uh, basically says, uh, you know, Essentially, it says, if you give me enough, sorry, if you give me enough uh, uh, stress, I can activate, I can lower my barrier. This is the iron idea. But as I'm trying to repeat for some of you, but the, the problem is, that this notion cannot explain when it turns brittle. Because the, you just give me more stress, I will lower the barrier, I will reach a point when the mobility, this is like the mobility, uh, uh, can eventually become high enough. So it turns out that the key that I uh, happen to, uh, to solve, at least conceptually, is to realize that one must answer where the stress come from. And the way we answered it is, you can see, it's the network. It's the network that enabled the barrier to be lowered. Conversely, if the network is not there, such as if your polystyrene is low molecular weight, there's no way you can make a fork out of it. Because your network is not there. So, uh, so we reach this magic point of you have your ability to yield because you have a strong network, high molecular polystyrene. Well, polystyrene, by the way, by the time you reach uh, 70 degrees, it will be ductile. It will not be what I showed you here. So be above 70, which is still 30 degrees below Tg, styrene is ductile. But as soon as I cool below 70, I realize I can no longer draw ductally. And our uh, 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 explanation, not a model, is to say, as you draw, this chain tension is building more and more, okay? Building on more and more. 
eventually, we, you see this, the, this tension is sustained by the junction. So if the junction cannot sustain that tension, you will have slide, which you can call it pull out. So our conjecture is that when the temperature is sufficiently cold, you will have chain pull out. And uh, uh, and uh, trying to create one more space. So, in any case, uh, so in any case, uh, basically, this brittle ductile transition that people are talking about, I just draw it from, uh, uh, from uh, Ward's book, is that there is a transition. This is the brittle ductile point. This is a Goldilocks temperature. Above which I, my network can do the job and activate, below which my network fails apart, falls apart first. Uh, through through uh, chain station. So this is the, uh, the, I say this because there's something important to conclude from here. Okay, so when the temperature is too low, we cannot predict how low that temperature is for a given problem, but we know there is such a point. At that point, you will reach a brittle failure because the network, uh, which is the driver for ductility and for yielding, is falling apart first because of the tension. Because of the tension it builds here, as I indicated in the pink, they're building a lot of tension. So, um, so what? what, what, what where is, where is the evidence that there, there is this network that it does the job? Where is anything? The power of this extremely simple idea is the following. It no longer can do the job at this point of brittle ductile transition because the network falls apart through so chain pull out. So we visualize that this stress perhaps is calculatable, this stress, let's call it brittle stress. Perhaps this stress is simply the force, the tension in each chain that's required to pull out, multiply structure of your problem, which we already worked out. Remember, this is just one over P, so varying strength. And we further know they are proportional, it is proportional to phi. So here comes the really, I think, is a rather powerful moment that this, so, you know, 13 here, there are five more. There's 18 polymers. This 18 polymers is behaving as Vincent found because phi is proportional to my new parameter structure factor of the, of the area density. In other words, the literature finding of the linear correlation of stress to the bound area density turns out to be the same as the stress with respect to the area density of low bearing bonds. In other words, this linearity of course, the open-minded USA, oh, this is a coincidence. Uh, be my guest. I mean, this, this could be a coincidence, 
but it, but it, it is uh, uh, it is a piece of information that we actually is using. I'm going to omit this part. Uh, we are using to to suggest that the brittle fracture of this 18 polymers is not related to flaw. And I will pick up that topic uh, a little later if we have time. So basically, this linear correlation is exactly our model. I hate to use the word predict. In other words, our model will also envision that the stress will be proportional to the data will be what Vincent found because the structure of the network happened to have the same molecular structure dependence as what Vincent plotted when he plotted the bond area density. Of course, these are totally different physics. We claim that the strength comes from the network, those circles on the right, not all the circles on the left. They are, this is the same game. Remember I showed you that the ratio of the two is a universal constant for all polymers. This fraction is independent of P. So just treat this axis as the packing lens changes. As you change the packing lens, the density of the absolute density changes. The relative density also changes because it's a constant ratio. So at the, for example, polyethylene is here because its area density is higher. But its it, the efficacy is the same because this ratio is, is a constant. I know this may sound convoluted uh, uh, for you the first time uh, because it confused me, meaning uh, I had to write a second, you know, in fact, I had to write uh, the second paper to correct what we did wrong with, uh, uh, in the second paper is where I, I solidified this idea that the, okay, let me just say it very clearly. As you go through the 13 polymers along this line, obviously you're changing. What's changing? The phi is changing. What phi changing means? Means the dot will take larger versus smaller areas. So per unit area, you will fit more bound. All right? That same effect does not change the fact that your, your network density absolute narrow density will also be higher because all the dots are getting smaller as I, as I, as I move along this axis. But the ad efficacy, the network for different polymers is equally dense or equally sparse. Okay? The ratio, the fra fraction of this is the same. So I had some uh, incorrect conclusions in the first paper, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, from the point of view of literature, uh, this, uh, this whole discussion is all, Goldilocks, this, this expression, is all uh, described in a paper first published in 2014. And until later, uh, 2019, right, that paper, uh, we, we had to uh, make a small uh, correction to that. But the bottom line is, is very simple. So, so let me just, sorry, let me just get to there. Uh, uh, what I didn't go through in great detail is turns out this brittle ductal transition depends on five factors meaning, sorry, a, a polymer is ductile or brittle depending on five factors. Uh, when you change temperature, of course, can turn brittle to ductile. Uh, there is a physical aging. I didn't sh show you the, the evidence. There is pressurization that my colleague, uh, Eric Baer, discovered that 
if you pressurize your styrene, you, at room temperature, your styrene become ductile. And uh, male stretching is what I showed you. And uh, rejuvenation is a, a, another intriguing concept. And uh, you can see this statement is incorrect. I didn't have a chance to, to correct it for you. <laughs> so, so the polycarbonate has a denser, absolute, on absolute term, it has a denser network than polystyrene. But on relative terms, they are, these polymers are all the same. So therefore, there's no way for me to predict styrene is more brittle than, than polycarbonate. Uh, so I don't know why I still had this statement here. Maybe to, maybe is to, uh, I mean, this is a fact, but this is not a prediction. Is what I'm saying. So it turns out that we can explain all the different features, why uh, you, uh, aging is bad, why uh, drawing bring chains closer, make ductility possible, and what the rejuvenation means, which is to activate the, the packing. So there are all kinds of things that you can speak about uh, to have a rough picture of what's going on. So let me just uh, move on so that I have some time to talk about fracture mechanics. Uh, let me move on to the second part of uh, of uh, solid state. And this is the part that uh, I think uh, I have uh, also uh, powerful thing to say. I, I don't care whether it's unique or not. Uh, coming back again, uh, uh, Stephen, to the issue of entanglement. Entanglement, you have by now heard it so many times. First, we know that concept in rheology. It gives you something called viscosity changing with the molecular weight to the 3.4 power. You blame that for entanglement. The fact that your polymer is viscoelastic, uh, strongly rubbery-like, is due to entanglement. It's all coming from uncrossability. Coming to the glassy polymer so far, people say it's, of course, due to entanglement because the shorter chains cannot give you any strength. But what I went through for you is a quantitative capture of exactly what this uncrossability did. It, I, it activates the network. It shows how the low bearing takes place through this network. Uh, so it's not just throwing words of entanglement, which has been done many, many times in the literature. Entanglement, uh, uh, sure, you need entanglement. But exactly, quantitatively, how, why you need entanglement, what does it, does it do, is not clear. Now, coming to semi-crystalline polymer, which is the most complex part of polymers, because it's, uh, you have to worry about the uh, morphology. You have to worry about now how chain packs, because they have two different states packed, either in the amorphous state disordered or packed in lamellar form or extended crystal, uh, extended chain form. Uh, it's more complicated, and indeed, a word used often is pol uh, uh, semi-crystalline polymers is a composite. That is very accurate to say. You've got a, a crystal that's like a filler, and somehow it's magically connected with the matrix, which is a morphous. So useful concept. It's a composite. It's, it's complicated. It's much more complicated than glassy polymer. Uh, do we speak about entanglement? Volume, yeah, we of course speak about entanglement. But in what sense? What does it do? How is it related to so-called tie chain? So on and so forth. I think, once again, uh, you can speak about entanglement as much as you wish, and it is discussed a lot. Again, uh, if you have a semi-crystalline polyethylene, when the molecular weight is very low, the polyethylene is not going to do the job because the chains are too short. So once again, what do you mean by having to have long enough chains? Right? Well, to the zeroth order, it actually means something quite trivial. So let me see if I can just use uh, some uh, and that's uh, sliding.
Oh, uh, so speak about it. I know, you know, of course. Sorry. I, I know we're not talking about crystallization a lot, uh, uh, but if you hear it for the first time, it's okay too. So basically in crystalline state, the chance famously likes to uh, take this uh, uh, lamellar form, so-called. And uh, there are many lamellar aggregated together. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, that the advantage of having high molecular weight is that it can provide connectivity between crystalline phases. And this chain will be called a tie chain. But there is something conceptually uh, uh, more trivial to, 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 to say, which is what I already said. Based on all we know from the literature, you make this conclusion. And perhaps I'm the one uh, emphasizing it more than anyone else. Your material will be horrible upon crystallization if somehow your crystallization heals uncrossability. Well, why does, why does it kill? Look, they sort out themselves like this. They will deplete all the chain crossing away from the crystalline phase. So if you cook in such a way that's kind of slow, you tend to uh, lose your chance to preserve the chain network. So the short, answer, short question is you want to have a polymer where the crystallization is not only fast, but also numerous. In other words, within, you know, if this is your uh, uh, size of your coil, you want your crystallization to take place within that many times. And, and occurs in such a way that the network is fixed instead of being destroyed. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, uh, easily said than done, but that's the spirit. If you uh, uh, wait and the chains grease out slowly, they will just try to gather, pack, and eventually lose the, most of the uncrossability between chains. In that limit, what is to provide you the connectivity? Now, there will be not, nothing left. So that's the, the essential, I mean, uh, speaking of, speaking of uh, the, 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 the ultimate dream. And the dream is something polyethylene achieved very well. Today we talk about sustainability. We talk about replacing polyethylene. Be my guest. If you can replace polyethylene, you definitely will get one Nobel Prize, the least. Well, you can not got the got theirs, but it polluted our world. <laughs> polyethylene, and polyethylene is crystallizing so fast. Uh, partially, not only because the structure is simple. But also, its Tg is minus 100 C, so its its very mo mobility is very high. So you could have very good uh, uh, polyethylene because they are uh, used here, because uh, because it, it crystallizes and hungry for. They will be hungry for free chains once it start to nucleate, but everyone every place is competing for the same free chains. You end up frustrated, not being able to do it. And that's the beauty of polyethylene. Polypropylene is a little bit not as good. You can even cook polypropylene to have sphere lights as big as uh, half a millimeter, many hundreds of microns. In that limit, did I show you next one? In that limit, which is this left figure, 
you lose ductility. when the sphere lines are very large. But here's what people talk about uh, entanglement. They talk entanglement in terms of volume density, of entanglement strength. But I have been speaking about area density. But that's how things get loaded, uh, cross-sectional. So uh, I just uh, give you a quick so 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 what here's the, uh, I showed you a polypropylene uh, when the sphere lines become very big it become not drawable and therefore lose ductility. Uh, I didn't show it here, but uh, also uh, people like uh, uh, Mandelkern uh, uh, have tried to patiently cook polyethylene until it has a crystallinity of. 70% 70, 70 or higher. And then your polyethylene turns brittle too, meaning unable to, to, to draw anymore. So you can see the crystallization can, can serve the role of destroying. The only connectivity there is to uncausability because crystallization sorted chains out. They are trying to pack chains, not crossing, but parallel to each other. So that's one uh, structural aspect of uh, uh, how morphology, how, how crystallization could affect the final mechanical problem. Well, there is the other aspect. I, I, I should have brought the sample, I didn't. Which is, for example, which is uh, a matter of temperature. So when you have polypropylene that's ductile, uh, many of your, uh, I have my water bottle that's polypropylene. It's ducked and, and some of the, 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 the ham container that you have find in grocery store, that's polypropylene. But when you bring the polypropylene below its Pg, which is minus 10 or so, in the freezer, for example, it turns brittle. So now you have all you have to deal with now. You have not only a semi crystalline polymer, but you have brought that polymer to the glassy state. In other words, the amorphous part now froze up, meaning unable to have any mobility anymore. In other words, you cannot treat the amorphous part as a rubbery face anymore. We'll be all lost if we didn't deal with the glass first, which we did, right? We just went through the polymer glass. So we have some appreciation of why the uh, polypropylene, when it's glassy, also loses uh, 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 ductility. Well, it's funny enough, above TG, it loses ductility, as I showed here, because the amorphous phase is rubbery. The loss of ductility there, as I said, is because you depleted the chain network. And we learned the chain network even in the melt state, can suffer a breakage. As I showed you, it, 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 uh, it produces strand localization, which is a, a failure of the network. So we're actually very familiar with the feature of uh, uh, network failure. So uh, indeed, uh, uh, one can do uh, different things. Uh, uh, you can perhaps even take your sample under a microscope. So this is a a movie taken by Travis, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, that uh, uh, th th that it fails uh, because there is not enough network there. When, when the sphere lights are very big, so uh, so you can see basically basically the failure start to occur at at where the connection between sphere lights. Okay, so I'm only going to give you one for the, uh, for the semi-crystalline polymer is still very complex, very difficult to get a handle on a, a conceptually simple picture of it. So I'm only just to give you one uh, example where we can, um, 
uh, we can uh, show some success. Do, do you want a break right now, Stephen? Before I go to the okay, we'll take a five minute break uh, before we uh, get to the rest of this. All right. Okay, so I, I'm only going to. Uh, this is a very complicated problem with, uh, with crystallization it. So I'm only going to give you a, uh, again, a flavor of how we can handle this problem. How can we uh, achieve crystallization without destroying the chain network? That's the, that's the very clear objective. Uh, and in particular, how we can help the world of sustainability, meaning, we all want to have a degradable polymer, a new polymer. But for example, the famous PLA, famous, when I say famous, thousands of papers written on it, and it's notoriously known as being brittle. PLA is uh, commercially available. Uh, quite a few plants are being built every time, now and then, uh, but it's brittle. Uh, it's brittle in two ways. Uh, PLA typically is used uh, with very little crystallization because it crystallizes quite slowly. Uh, without crystallization, its TG is only 60 degrees, so it's not heat resistant. So it would be desirable to have crystallization, and there are ways to encourage crystallization. And this is just a slide showing when you have crystallization, of course, just like if you're P, uh, polyethylene, it's, it turns uh, milky, right, non-transparent, but it's hardly drawable as shown by these uh, 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 curves, stress versus draw, draw ratio. Uh, if you code crystallize, which is to have your, this PLA has a glass one here at 60 degrees, it crystallizes so slowly, so you can bypass crystallization to get to a, a purely glassy amorphous state. The amorphous polymer turns out is, uh, is brittle as a glass. Uh, you can also warm up this glass above its TG to achieve cold crystallization. And typically that uh, spherulites are much smaller because it's so cold, uh, you have no trouble having lots of uh, uh, nucleation sites. And they are all competing for the free chains, so you can never grow a very large sphere line. But if you come from melt state to crystallize around 120 or so, uh, you can have much larger sphere line. But either way, uh, the sample at room temperature is already glassy, so it's, it turns out it's brittle. Uh, even above TG, it doesn't draw very well. So there is a lot of indication that the crystallization, if you patiently wait for it to happen, uh, is disrupting the chain network. That's the, that's the same reasonable way to say it. So of course you can uh, find out uh, the evidence of crystallization and I will skip the, the, the rest of the details. So, yes, polylactic acid, yeah. Well, obviously the, 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 the mobility is a key factor. So in fact, I'm not sure it, it is through bacteria. Usually it's a hydrolysis. It's not, yeah, it's degradable. Uh, it's not, uh, yeah, I, I'm. That's obvious because it's more mobile, I suppose, yeah. So in fact, there is a study that, uh, that we are involved, but I, my student involved, I, I didn't even want to be part of that study. But yeah, we, there are people who are studying the degradation of PLA currently so, uh, with one of my students. So uh, basically it's a very unusable polymer until we uh, propose to design through the rheology you learned, through the criteria of achieve, uh, preserving uh, chain networking. So the idea was uh, 
was uh, you have, you're now familiar with this, my whole mental picture. You have a network, you're going to, uh, uh, you are going to consider such a polymer PLA without crystallization by quenching. Then once you're above TG, uh, you treat this as a melt, you try to stretch it. Uh, you imagine the chains are, are getting aligned, uh, uh, serving as nucleating sites. The whole idea was a design to make sure that crystallization occurs in every unit of your network, of your chain network or entanglement network. So the whole idea was that uh, upon drawing, you're going to have chain alignment and that will give you crystallization at every uh, mesh size and everyone will compete for the free chains to be added to the crystal. And they, very quickly, they become frustrated and unable to do anything. Yet, uh, you, if you have crystallization, it would occur on nanoscopic scales on the size of your, of your network. So that was the, uh, uh, I, uh, that was the physical picture. And uh, indeed, uh, this was realizable uh, as shown by this uh, uh, recent AFN picture. So the drawing direction is horizontal. And uh, the white parts are the crystals, which are uh, most, uh, which are stiffer. So you can see this is a, a really a, 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 a clearly a, a nanoscale uh, morphology, obviously not spherilites. And it's not, we are still in the middle of figuring out the, whether these are lamellars or, or not. But uh, basically, it's uh, the 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 crystalline phase is connected because uh, because it was made to occur at uh, the network building block level. So this is a, a really a remarkable image. I, I think it shows the, the impression of a network on nanoscales. So the separation of uh, of uh, the different layers of the crystal is uh, predictable to some degree and, and in fact agree with the calculation. This is an AFM measurement and you can also do small angle uh, x-ray uh, to get the long period and they are all in agreement. So it is that physics that allowed us to confidently say that this predictably also, it's powerfully predictable in this case. So you see how little we know we know very little about why styrene is brittle or poly polycarbonate is ductile. We don't know anything predictive. And we know not enough about semi-crystalline polymers. But this thing, this product, was nearly predictive. Uh, it is transparent because the crystals are confined to, to the space of, uh, of the mesh size. Uh, it preserved the network because by design, the network will have no chance to sort out before it gets fixed by these crystals. And uh, moreover, it's heat resistant because now it's not the TG, but the melting of this crystal that determines the, the integrity of the sample, which is uh, way over 120 degrees. So at 100 degrees, you can hold the boiling water. Yeah. This, this cup, this is the cup from which we had the F, F, AFN image here. So that's the, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, so this was designed, this PLA, which is famously brittle, was designed to become ductile, to become transparent, or rather to become, to become ductile and to have heat resistant because you have building crystallization through uh, this uh, uh, chain stretching induced nano confined crystallization. And it's transparent because the crystals are so small. What well, also evidenced by, 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 the, uh, by the AFM, the spacing. Yeah. You know, it's 
if if you tell me look i know enough about uh, uh, uh well, i know element it only shows i don't know actually if you tell me this afm picture without showing me the sample i don't think i can tell you it will be transparent okay the reason is look at the strings it's quite long Okay, this scale is five, uh, 500 nanometers. That's the visible light. So this string uh, is, is approaching the uh, visible light. So I would, uh, I, this is where I know so little. I would say, oh, this thing may not be transparent because it, it matches the, the wavelengths of the light. Yet it is, or uh, largely it is. Uh, Right, so I don't, so, so there got to be somebody who can calculate. In fact, it got to be some, it's like finite element calculation kind of, I mean, whether this structure can scatter light. Uh, the structure spatially this way is only 20 nanometers. So that, that shouldn't scatter light. But this, this strip, this thread is quite large. Uh, so yeah, if you ask me why it's transparent, I have no clue. Uh, we were dreaming that it's transparent because they are going to be small. The, you see the, the crystal is growing vertical. So it's drawing this way. The crystal is growing uh, uh, be, because, because of this purple things. Uh, it is going to grow unless, until it's disrupted by the fact that the chain's network is not so regular. So it, it will stop somewhere. But yeah, I don't have an answer why it should be uh, totally transparent but it's nearly totally transparent. As you can see from this movie, the, the cloud is coming from the steam. So, uh, so this scenario, hopefully uh, will be uh, used again and again uh, uh, in the future for other polymers, uh, for other semi-creasing polymers. It's, uh, um, so we, you know, we, we'll see what, how far this will go. Um, we're still working on semi-crystal polymers. It's a complicated problem. It's not finished. But we were uh, also uh, eager to move on uh, because we know if you have a cut in your sample, uh, you tend to ha show some weakness uh, in your plastic. So we were interested in finding out what is that uh, cut. So uh, this is just a summary, I can skip it. So uh, this for us is a brand new structure mechanics. And I think I have already motivated you for it. Uh, because if it turns out, if you read these books that I listed, four of them, one book is devoted to fractures of polymers. Uh, you realize that uh, they find an easy way out through fracture mechanics. Take your polymer, you say, go back to this page so I can write something. Take your polymer, you say, it doesn't matter which polymer. So. Uh, it doesn't matter which polymer. So it, it, it could be your, your, your polycarbonate, your dear polycarbonate. It will show, in fact, I, I, I supplemented this. Uh, I think I supplemented. Yeah, so I added one figure here. This is the Vincent plot, okay? This is the Vincent plot that I published in our paper by showing that this slope, you know, by calculating that this, uh, you know, sort of making a, a guess. This is always a issue. So basically, uh, 
basically, this is my model. Uh, the the um, uh, th th these are the Vincent's uh, data showing where it's done. So, for example, polycarbonate is here. Okay, it uh, uh, become brittle at 100 minus 140 degrees, and it fits onto this line because it just so happened all these polymers. We made a guess about what this density is because this they are proportional to each other, but the proportionality constant is something nobody can calculate. So I made a guess that this is about a tenth of the phi, and it turns out the pulling out force is also about a tenth of the breaking force. In that case, I will get a slope that shows the pull out force is about the tenth of the breaking force. And that explains why you have a factor of 100. So it's hundred a factor of ten weaker here, a ten a factor of ten weaker here, and that's why the observed stress is a factor of a hundred weaker than the true theoretical strength. So, in other words, we sort of have an idea of why the observed stress is much strength is much lower than theoretical one. Already, if we trust. How much we can trust? Well, I tell you, I can trust that it's not due to transition. So this factor of 10, uh, is obtained as soon as we assume that the density is a factor of 10 small. So, uh, so in any case, uh, uh, this is a picture assuming that your polymer, that your polymer sample is perfect. But this is not how we started. When we had a factor of 100 weaker strength, uh, the common idea, dominant idea in the literature is to blame flaw, which I flashed one of the, uh, the, the word textbook showing that, is to say, oh, it's weaker because you have flaw. So let me start with that concept here. Okay? The, and, 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 and also show you why that concept is wrong for, for our polymer, it's wrong. So just keep in mind that the theoretical strength of your polymer is 15 gigapascals, and you find by observation it's only 0.05 gigapascals, a factor of 100, okay? A factor of 100 apart. God knows why there is a factor of 100, but we know this estimate is off for two reasons. It shouldn't be all the low bearing strands and all the, it shouldn't involve transition. So we know theoretically it's wrong, that estimate. It's not a factor of 100 larger than observed. What we don't know is exactly how much weaker it is. So a starting point is to say, oh, this is your theoretical strength. If that's the case, then we go home, everything's done. But since we had some misunderstanding about the value that's 100 times larger, we blamed flaws for not observing this higher strength. Here, we are so much influenced by Griffith's famous Griffith's idea. So I, I want to go through that a little bit. In fact, that's just part of the syllabus of your course, actually. Yeah. So I'm eager to, to, to talk about that, actually. Now, so, so, Griffiths uh, made this paper in exactly 100 years ago. We are celebrating fracture mechanics this year, 1921. He has this problem to deal with. He was told glass 
as a strength of 10 gigapascal. And we find in our experiment of a silica glass to be 100 megapascal, exactly 100 times smaller. He got mad, I think he got mad, and tried to figure out why. So I will probably spend a great deal of time uh, trying to, uh, as it goes there, trying to uh, 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 share with you what's going on. So let me go through the slides and then I will come back to, uh, uh, to, uh, to some handwriting. Uh, fraction mechanics, uh, very new to us. Uh, there are books written already, however, so it's not new field. Especially, even when you apply fraction mechanics to polymers, it's not new. There's a book as I showed you here. It is perhaps largely motivated by trying to explain why you have such low strength in a brittle polymer like polystyrene PMMA. Um, well, in any case, uh, polymer is a much newer material than steel, and the people learned about uh, the success, or, or I don't know, I call it success or not, of fraction mechanics for glasses, so that they started to do the same for polymer. Now, I will go through some details to the on this, but basically, you have to understand fraction mechanics according to our textbooks. Is, is stand on two pillars. One is Griffith's idea of energy balance argument. I will try to be brief, talk about it. The other is the recognition that if you have a cut, then the stress in front of the tip is intensified. These are two different independent ideas, but often in the literature considered to be equivalent. I have my views about it. Uh, I don't know how much I will be able to hear. But uh, let's go with uh, the notations of, uh, of, the, of this uh, called uh, uh, so-called energy release rate. So I will be able to show you, uh, I didn't rehearse this part, but I would hope to be able to show you that according to Griffiths, uh, this energy release rate at the point of fracture of your glass should be about twice of the surface energy. And I will develop that for you. For silicon glass, this turns out to be true. In other words, this GC indeed was found to be about twice of them. For steel, it's not true. The GC is much larger than surface energy. So you wonder, gee, why people still proceeded with fraction mechanics. Well, that's because there is a stress intensification approach, which is valid in the sense uh, the stress in front of the cut is always higher. So you can proceed and do something. But let me uh, uh, first indicate a textbook piece of information. You can find in textbooks that for polymers, GC, is listed to have a value which is about 100 times larger than the theoretical value. By the way, the theoretical value was, of course, incorrectly estimated. And if you do my estimate in the same spirit, you will say they are different by a factor of 10,000. Okay? So we'll come back to this. Uh, whether what this means and whether we should ab abandon this approach or not. So let me just go to, uh, yeah. Yeah, getting close. Oh, I guess, I see. So let me, let me just give you, uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't realize that. So we are not going to be able to finish uh, uh, much of it. Uh, let me just give you a sense. No, no, yeah, okay, I didn't realize that. So basically, you, you can develop a Griffiths energy argument, energy balance argument, 
by saying that if you have a cut, what happens is compared to an uncut sample, you will lose uh, you will lose energy in terms of the stored energy. You know, suppose you draw it like this. So it turns out that uh, I, I'm fine. So I, I, I actually said much of what I need to say. It turns out that it's, it's possible for you to estimate. So if this is a cut lens A, then it's possible to estimate that you're going to lose a, and there is certain thickness that's called D. You're going to lose certain uh, uh, energy. How much you're going to lose? You're going to lose about A squared times D times the energy density. That's how much energy you're going to lose. How much you are going to gain? You're going to gain about twice of A times D times gamma. Because the surface, so the whole idea was whether there's enough energy loss that's favoring the loss of that energy to produce the surface. So if you equate the two, if you equate the two, you get the result at, at, at the breaking. And uh, so I cancel two of them. It's two gamma on this side. It's A W C on the side. And that A W C uh, is, uh, it, seems, it turns out that you can easily show that this is about this. So it turns out uh, uh, what you have is this value. And people call this GC. So according to Griffiths, the energy that you can calculate from knowing how much is the stress and the, the Young's modulus, the cut lens, you can compute for what GC is when the crack goes through. And you can compare this number with surface energy. Yeah. Oh, God. Jesus, this thing keep, keep occurring, this advantage of showing slides. I'm so sorry, you, you have seen none of this, but now here it is. <laughs> oh, you guys should stop me. Uh, so in any case, I, I, if you can remember what I said, here's the, uh, the expression. So you have an energy that you lose because you have a crack, that part no longer can store energy. And you have a new surface that depends on the surface area, which is the cut lens versus the thickness times the surface area, uh, give you energy, and this give you energy, and then the the, the energy for uh, for storage turns out is related to the stress as well as uh, the Young's module. So you end up having a GC that you can calculate anytime when you perform experiment. You find for glass, this happened to agree with. Uh, uh, the surface uh, energy. But for polymers, as I showed you, uh, you are off by 10,000 times. So to me, that speaks for trouble. Meaning that means there's something fishy about this approach. In fact, my short conclusion is, is uh, you cannot blame the cut. This is being, being written up right now. You cannot blame the cut for the for the failure, because uh, in short, because this relationship for this relationship to magically hold, you have to have your polymer having all the so-called cut or internal flaws of of an agreeable amount. Such that, you, such that this correlation will not be destroyed. So in any case, I, I know I'm running out of time. I, I apologize uh, for that. Uh, in short, the, uh, the, there is a, a lot to, to, you know, I'm not going to go through this experiment. I know some of uh, 
you have seen it already. Uh, basically, it was presented at the APS uh, March meeting. So, uh, in any case, so uh, I, I, we, we, uh, uh, I'm just giving you a flavor about uh, 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 mechanics as a whole, polymer mechanics as a whole, and it just so happened that fracture mechanics uh, should be part of the game in the sense that. Um, Go back. In the sense, uh, uh, in particularly in the sense of addressing whether the theoretical strength uh, is what we already observed. Yeah. So I'm sorry for, for getting beyond the time now. We have to stop here. We'd like to thank 